30. We'll call the meeting of the Louisville City Council to order. We do have a quorum present. So, Mayor Council, tonight we wanted to give you an update on the Garden Ridge Trail Project. Uh, as you know, uh, this is a grant project, a $2.3 million project. It is almost fully designed, and we have done some notifications, and so I know some questions are out there, so we wanted to get it uh, before you guys again to make sure we're uh, answering all the issues you may have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stacey. All right. Uh, Mayor of Council Park fans, just wanted to give you an update on the Garden Ridge Trail, kind of tell you where we've been up until this point and where we're heading and talk a little bit about the design just in case you're getting questions based on some of the notifications we had to send out due to the TxDOT grant. So this is a little bit to uh, tell you the project location where we're coming off of where Garden Ridge hits I-35 down to where uh, north Valley Park where it hits uh, Garden Ridge and coming down to the city annex area is the general um, location of, of the project. Um, just as a reminder, this <coughs> general trail system, whether it be on street or off street, was identified when the hike and bike master trail master plan was put together back in 2011. Um, and it was reiterated in the 2013 Park Master Plan when it called for the implementation of that trail plan. In 2014, we submitted a Transportation Alternative Program grant application where we were awarded the, the project through the uh, North uh, Central Texas Council of Governments. It's a 75-25 grant. Right now, the project's estimated about 2.3. That's what we submitted. And our local match requirement was just over uh, $500,000. There's also a state requirement that helps us meet, meet in the middle. Um, that took place, and we, the application was approved by City Council in 2014, and in the fall of 2014, we received notification that we would get the grant. In 2015, uh, Half Associates was a uh, was brought on to do design services for that. And at that time, that project location map that we showed at the beginning was in that presentation to city council. So the route shouldn't be um, too big of a surprise. In 2016, we finalized the advanced funding agreement with TxDOT. Those can take a while sometimes. And then in 2017, in March, just before I got here, there was actually a public meeting at the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board where 80 of the residents along that corridor were, in, were invited to come see what the route was. About 15 were there. There are various comments. The most um, a reiterated one was whether we were going to have a dedicated bike lane, and I'll get to why we're not down the road. But all the residents along that corridor were invited to see what that res that would be. Do we have a list? We do. I did find a list. Okay, thank in there. you. And that's how I got to the 80. Lovely. Um, so we reviewed the design, the proposed path forward. In June of last year, I gave a presentation to the 2025 committee. Come on in. Um, on the, and the update included the cap in the capital projects, those trails. Um, we did the same thing at the July Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting, and those are all publicly posted meetings. In 2018, later this year, as we got towards the end of the design, we're about 95%. And when you get to 95% with a TxDOT project, you go back and forth a lot on revising comments. One of the things that they have required us as part of our envi the environmental agreement um, portion is that we have to distribute letters to everybody that is along the corridor. And they dictate what those letters said. So we massaged them a little bit, but essentially it was what TxDOT approved. We probably wouldn't have said it quite that way. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's a lot of uh, technical wording um, that's difficult for me to understand. So, and just as a reminder, because of the timeline and our commitments, this project must be bid by August of, of this year um, in order to keep the funding. A uh, little bit of the design overview is, and this is kind of turned on its end just because it's lengthwise hard to get in otherwise. Over here is I-35. The start of the project runs down 
Garden Ridge, like I said, down to where we meet North Valley Parkway, the median uh, trails will go and hit the ones that come out of LL Woods and go down to um, Civic Center. The colors on this chart kind of indicate the width that the sidewalk will be or the, the, the increased path will be. It also indicates that in these areas where we're having a shared uh, use lane, there will be share rows in the, in the driving lane. So in the driving lanes closest to the curbs, we'll have share rows. And I'll go over that just a little bit more. There will only be one point of the project where there are not share rows, and that's where we're able to actually get into the median and construct a 12-foot um, multi-use hike and bike trail that you know, pedestrians and bicycle, <coughs> bicyclists can use without having to worry about interacting with traffic. Uh, on and this section along the Garden Ridge Trail, we'll be, be uh, constructing the trail on the north side of the street, and then once we get to North Valley Parkway, we're going to move to the east side of the street, and we'll show you a little bit more about that um, right here. So in this section down from I-35 to Justin Road, this shows you where the enhancement to the sidewalk will occur along the north and west side, I guess. Um, and these little uh, yellow or red dots indicate where each of the sharrows will be located. By NACTO standards, they have to be located every 200, 250 feet. Um, and that will occur on both outside lanes. So the improvement to the sidewalk will only occur on the north and west side of the lane, but the sharrows will be in both um, directions each way. And then you'll see here, we also get an opportunity to connect to Highland, um, Par Highlands Park through another 12-foot trail that'll be a great connector for our system. Uh, this is a little bit, we didn't have a specific one from the consultant yet on this, but this is where in the medians we'll jump to a 12-foot trail, which is great because it's right next to the elementary school. It'll give kids an opportunity. If you drive this route every day, you notice that kids are coming down up this little sidewalk to school. It'll give them an opportunity to use a, an easier sidewalk, have less um, conflicts with traffic. Um, each of the sidewalks in, in the medians will be um, improved as well along that route. And then once we get here to the North uh, Valley Parkway area, we'll have this little bit of extension to hit the trail that already exists um, and coming out of Leonard L.L. Uh, Woods Park and the Valley Ridge uh, um, trail system, but then we'll head down uh, North Valley Parkway with Sharrows and improved. So, come on in. Uh, well, that's strange. Technical difficulties. So, from what we have, this will give you a good example of when we hit North uh, Valley Parkway, we'll come in here and improve the sidewalk um, system there. Now, when you, if you remember on that first um, slide that we showed you with the whole um, project, there were different colors. We're not going to be able to improve the entire sidewalk system on Garden Ridge and North Valley Parkway to an eight-foot sidewalk because there are some areas where we just don't have that much right-of-way. So we'll be varying between a six-foot and an eight-foot. One of the good example is along uh, North Valley Parkway when you get uh, south of Old Orchard, there are some uh, uh, brick mailboxes that would prevent us from going all, all the way to the end and we don't want to take someone's ability to receive mail from the U.S. Postal Service. But <laughs> further, uh, closer to the uh, Garden uh, Ridge Parkway, we do have the capacity to get eight feet of trail um, because we have that sound wall and no, no impediments in there. So you'll see that. We'll also continue with the sharrows on both sides of the parkway um, every 200, 250 feet. Um, 
And this is where people had kind of during that park board meeting, I think uh, Mr. Troyer might be able to speak to this, had asked why we aren't going to have a dedicated bike lane. Well, one, there's not enough room in the roadbed to do that all the way through. Um, but also, there is some uh, conversation that some of our dedicated bikeways, with the way that they're not used enough and they don't get, we don't have enough protection as they, debris gets into them and it causes issue. Sharrows seem to be a much easier way to navigate the system. Um, the improvements to the sidewalk will continue all the way to Main Street, um, and we will add the Sharrows to the Civic Drive uh, circle. Council, one thing we may want to clarify here, what Stacy was saying, I'll take you to street view. I believe this is looking south on the east or northbound side of North Valley Parkway. This section has houses fronting it, especially on the, the trail side, again, will be on the east or northbound lane. And you'll note that back on the slide six, their, their previous slide, you'll see the distance. Again, the sidewalk widening is from the inside edge of the existing sidewalk at, out toward the curb or parkway. It will not go toward the houses. So in these cases, I think this is a calls for a, side, um, a six foot widening or a five foot walk. And it very well maybe could because of the distance between the, the mailboxes and the lack of <coughs> parking lanes here. You don't have as much parkway to, to work with without impacting something, whether it's parallel parking or the mailboxes, and that's essentially from, oh, I'd say Old Orchard to College Parkway uh, on the north or east side. So that kind of goes to the route. This kind of speaks to what uh, Mr. Ferris was speaking of, is that all the extension of the sidewalk is going to be towards the street into what is already our right-of-way. Um, and it'll be six to eight feet. We're not going to ask for any additional easements. The only place that we're asking for an additional easement is back behind um, on that <clears throat> where we're taking the, the, uh, the 12 foot trail to Highlands Parkway. We're going to need an easement from Walmart and YMCA because we're touching their property because Encore won't let us build a trail under their high uh, transfer lines. They'll let us go under the old ones. Go back one slide. Real quick on Civic, as Stacy pointed out, the, the, the project goes all the way to Main Street along Valley Parkway, but you'll notice the Sharrows on Civic. There's just Sharrows going on on both lanes there, but there is no widening of the sidewalk because we already widened the, the walk earlier. So the only thing on Civic will be the Sharrow lanes all the way around the main. Um, and any time, if something has installed irrigation or something in our right-of-way, what we'll do is the contractor will work with, make some field adjustments on site to help move their stuff. Um, we'll also, this will also be a good opportunity when the contractor is, is designated that if people want to work with them to improve their own sidewalks back to their house, they can ask them why they're out there on site to do that at their own cost. I do think that's one of the most confusing points when we sent out those letters. I think some people were a little afraid that they were going to be required to give an easement, and really, it's never an easement of their own property. It's the park board. Right. Well, I think I think some of the confusion also is in those letters you saw up to 12 feet, mm -hmm. and it really I I was confused until I saw the color coded map it's, on it's where confusing. what's going where. Yes. Um, so and then you know people uh, right here. What is a share route? Right. If you're not a cyclist, you're not really going to know what that right. means. <laughs> right. So a sharrow is essentially this little arrow and bicycle um, icon that will be painted on to the, the streetway um, on each of the outside lanes, the, the through lanes um, there. Like I said, they have to be every uh, 200, 250 feet. Um, and then we're going to have the 12-foot shared use trail through the Garden Ridge Parkway median and the Encore easement, and there will not be any sharrows in that area. Um, what we'll do is at the July Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, we'll give another up, we'll give the same presentation so if people weren't able to get to this workshop today, we can talk a little bit about it then. 
We're working on the final approval of the design from TechSot. Like I said, that's a lot of back and forth between the 95% and 100% design uh, uh, status. But we will be looking to issue bids before August 15th to make sure that we meet that grant expectation. Uh, then we'll award uh, the contract for construction, hopefully being ready to go by October, November, depending on how negotiations uh, go. And then it will be a 14 to 18 month project. Now what we'll do once we have an award uh, for contract for construction, we'll send out another uh, letter to all the residents along that corridor inviting them to meet with us and the contractor so they kind of know when construction will take place in front of their property and if they want to have that additional work done by the contractor maybe to fix some of their concrete between their house and the sidewalk at their own expense. They could work with them on their own at that point, which is kind of a good deal when you have something like this going on. So we've already identified our match and are ready to move forward depending on what the bids come back. Hopefully in this time two years from now we'll be cutting a ribbon and riding down the road for a good old <coughs> grand old party. Right. Any questions? Do they have any questions? <clears throat> and, uh, move forward then. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Now we'll go to the uh, workshop agenda on the uh, regular agenda. We'll start with the invocation by Councilman Ferguson, followed by the pledge to the flags by Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Proclamations given by uh, Bob. Then we got public hearing. Any questions on the overlay district? This certainly has been a long time coming. Uh, our planning staff has spent uh, many hours, our legal staff has spent many hours on this ordinance. Uh, so we're glad to, to deliver it today. I've heard some great feedback from a couple of developers on the staff walking through. So. Been a lot of one-on-one -on -one <coughs> to answer a lot of questions. Well, I think that's that's a that's a huge thing that the city has done on this project to make this very easier for, for folks to understand what the changes are. It's very different. Uh, item two, public hearing. You actually already approved this once back in April of 2017. It has expired. Uh, there were some issues, legal dispute between the applicant and the property owner. They do believe all that is now resolved. So they're coming again with the exact same requirements or variances uh, asking for your reapproval. Okay. Item 3, public hearing on the low school juvenile curfew ordinance. You see this every year. Okay. Is it every three or every years? Third year. Every third year. I say every year, every third year. <coughs> that, Seems I was like opposed to this when it was established, and I still am. Yes, <laughs> yes, Mayor, That's I know. That's all I'm going to say about. I know, Mayor. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any stats on this? Uh, in your backup memo, it shows you uh, the number of um, actual citations that are written every year from 1994. Through 2017, and I, I find it kind of interesting because there's just a lot of variation. Uh, where's Chief Urban? No, Kevin. Kevin. Kevin is probably going to be better to explain that variation than I can. Yeah, you can see the the last three years we had 18 citations written. Before that, when the when the ordinance first went into to effect, we were much higher. Uh, as the years have progressed, it's dropped somewhat, but it does fluctuate. No rhyme or reason for that fluctuation that weakened the problem. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. We'll go down to the consent agenda. Item four. It's a very long consent agenda now. <laughs> okay. Nothing on that. Item five, regular hearing. <coughs> Six. <laughs> item seven. On item seven, uh, I would like Chris McGann, our health 
director to talk a little bit about this particular item. And I wanted him to talk about it in relation to other food service regulations because I think it kind of gets confusing on what we're changing here, uh, but what other provisions are also in effect. So I thought it'd be helpful if you spent a little bit of time doing that. Mayor, Council. Um, what I was going to do is just describe uh, currently what the ordinance is now, and then uh, towards the end I'll talk about uh, some of the changes that are uh, that we're excited to to bring about uh, for the Old Town Design District. So, uh, overall idea of this is just keep in mind anytime food is offered to the public, a permit is required uh, for that. There's many different variations of what type of permit you need, but this basically just focuses on the main ones that affect. Uh, this particular ordinance uh, that we're uh, looking at some changes being made. So your food service permit is your regular uh, brick and mortar uh, food establishment. Uh, so we have uh, over 580 of these locations uh, in Louisville. Uh, key words are commercial kitchen uh, that's uh, being permitted by the city. Um, basically what we're focusing on uh, with this is uh, temporary food establishments. So anytime you move uh, beyond your commercially permitted kitchen and you're offering food to the public, um, meaning food preparation for the public, uh, then a temporary event permit is required. Um, this goes beyond just regular preparation in a kitchen and serving, that's catering, but this is actually food preparation or food sales on site. Uh, that kicks in your temporary health permit. Uh, examples of this would be uh, like an outdoor barbecue, that's uh, foods being served to the public, a crawfish boil, um, permit is still required because uh, uh, health services wants to go out on site and make sure that that food is safe for the public, that the food is coming from an approved source uh, so that we don't have folks getting sick out there. Um, currently the frequency of a temporary food uh, service establishment is um, six per year and you have to have 60 days between events and the duration of that is a 10 day max. Um, and so. Um, Sometimes people get temporary food establishment and a special event uh, confused. Um, they're actually two separate things. So um, building inspection uh, makes the determination when a establishment goes beyond its intended use, um, uh, intended and permitted use of the property. So um, uh, anytime you have a, a excess, uh, let's say a, a location is designed for um, just sit down dining and they want to basically hold a benefit for um, you know live music and maybe they'll have the live music set up on the patio you know that, that may or may not require a special event permit and um, if a special event permit um, is going to be offering food for the public um, outside of the restaurant establishment uh, then in addition to a special events permit, a temporary health permit would be required for that. Um, another type of permit that we have uh, are mobile vendor permits. Um, and those are vehicle mounted food establishments. So in your mind, if you think of what a, like a, a gourmet food truck, a fully enclosed vehicle mounted food establishment uh, is, that would be considered a mobile vendor permit. Currently we permit those for the entire year. Um, and so uh, the changes that we've made uh, with these is that um, if you are a TABC permitted uh, winery, distillery, or uh, brewery, then the requirements on your frequency for a temporary food establishment, uh, basically the 60 days goes away between events. Uh, we're allowing eight per year um, and a two day max on those. Um, what we didn't want to do was have six per year and keep the 10 days because then you could, or keep the eight per year and have the 10 days because then you could have 80 days of consecutive cooking outside. So, um, so basically additional permits, uh, eight per year, um, and uh, no time between events, um, but they can't be any longer than two consecutive days. And that was primarily <coughs> requested because I think in the summer that's when they want to have a lot of outdoor type of events and so that's 60 days in between preventing that. So by extending the, the number of times from six to eight, but I think especially by removing that 60 days in between 
gives them a lot more flexibility uh, for the summer months when people are out and want to enjoy themselves. Okay, I, I had a question. What what was the reasoning for since the Main and Mill requested twelve per year? Where did you, what's the reasoning for going to eight? Instead of Some of that is a balance. I mean, we like to see the impact on staff, uh, and uh, we'd like to just see the overall uh, impact uh, to our workload uh, and such. So we'll start there, and, and we'll evaluate. In addition to that, um, looking at what our survey cities consider a temporary event, we were pretty much in line six to eight uh, temporary permits. There were a few smaller cities that didn't have any restrictions, but when asked that question, if they had a situation where somebody was asking for 10, 12, uh, you know, they, they said that they would look at their ordinance and maybe make some restrictions there, because there's a certain point where things are no longer temporary if they're able to do it, you know, uh, with, with a higher amount of uh, permits per year. Um, we did go back and visit with my new mail about uh, the aid, and I think they feel that's acceptable at this point. In addition to that, um, we've made some <coughs> policy changes on our mobile vendors, and so now we're offering a prorated rate for mobile vendors instead of a $300 permit. Let's say um, all mobile vendor permits expire December 31st. So if somebody, a mobile vendor was going to come in and get permitted in November, then they would have to pay $300 for just two months. And so now with that proration being in effect, they'd only be charged $50 for a permit. Uh, their permit would only be good for two months, but the permit's a lot cheaper. So um, we had a lot of, um, and, and I understand that, uh, a mobile vendor not necessarily wanting to come in for a permit, um, you know, just just to have uh, you know a permit that's in good standing with the health department for two months. So um, these these changes will definitely work with our unique um, businesses that we have in Old Town, and um, hopefully uh, that kind of laxes uh, laxes up the restrictions that our current ordinance uh, has uh, to make it easier on, on business. So, quick question, uh, and maybe you just left it out of the grid because it's not relevant. And if so, let me know. Um, where do the hot dog carts at Home Depot and the elotes carts at the gas stations. Right. Where do they show up in here? So we have um, basically there's certain types of food service establishments. We've got temporary or mobile vendors. We've got our general cart vendors, which are your, your elote carts and your hot dog carts. Mm -hmm. And then you have your snow cone stands. Um, so those are all sub, sub, they're all permitted but, they're, but they're, it's a different kind of permit than an actual food service establishment permit would be. So like we would have just, if we wanted to keep it focused on this particular issue, okay, but, but there's if another you want, column that yeah, there'd be another there column is. for that. Okay. There is. Then a whole another set of requirements and rules that, that go along just for those types of cards. But they get 365 a year. Yeah, yeah, they're all year round for those. Okay. We're going to have to move on to uh, number eight. Is there any questions on it? Thank you. Boards and commissions. Okay. And with that, we'll reconvene at uh, 7 o'clock in the council chamber. At 7 o'clock, I'll call tonight's meeting of the Louisville City Council to order. Uh, first item of business, the invocation given by Councilman Ferguson, uh, followed by the pledge to the American and Texas flags by Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer and meditation. Thank you. Please join me in the pledge to the American and Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. 
<clears throat> trying to trip me up. Get some cans going. Council has proclamations by Councilman Troyer. Uh, do we have a representative of the uh, women's veterans here? Uh, would you come forward, please? <clears throat> Our first proclamation is <clears throat> for uh, Women's Veterans Day. Whereas Texas salutes and rep remembers the many American female veterans who have courageously and honorably served in the military on beha behalf of our nation, and whereas women have formally been a part of the United States Armed Forces since the inception of the Army Nurse Corps in 1901, but pr have proudly served alongside <clears throat> and supported our nation's military since the American Revolution, and whereas the women veterans community is the fastest growing subset of American veterans in Texas, women comprise over 13% of the veteran population, a percentage which is higher than the national average and increasing yearly. And whereas women veterans of America, of, when, women's veterans of America, chapter 48, and the Denton County Military Veterans Peer Network advocate for a cultural transformation to raise awareness about their service and sacrifice of women's veterans. And whereas on June 9th, 2017, Greg Abbott, governor of Texas, <coughs> signed Senate Bill 805, declaring that June 12 be, be celebrated as Women's Veterans Day in order that all Texans recognize the role of women in the military forces and to commemorate the sacrifices and valor displayed by Texas women veterans. And whereas on this day, the city of Louisville commemorates the fearless service of women who have served our nation in the armed forces. And we honor our female veterans and their families for the remar remarkable sacrifices <clears throat> and outstanding contributions to our nation. Now therefore, Rudy Durham, mayor of the city of Louisville, Texas, and on behalf of the Louisville City Council, hereby declares June 12, 2018, as Women Veterans Day in Louisville, and encourages all residents to recognize the courage and contributions of the generations of American service women and their families who have proudly served our great state and nation, doing their part to protect our land, people, freedoms, and legacy. I'm Camilla Zimbel, and I'm a resident of Louisville, have been for 37 years. Um, I'm also the commander of WVA 48, and one of the reasons that we started this chapter in Denton County is because we have the highest number of women veterans in the state of Texas, even over uh, California. And we have so many young soldiers. In fact, our chapter has only been chartered for a year, and we already have 60, 62 members. And that's growing every single day. We have so many members coming from Iraq and Afghanistan and coming out who need our support, who need our help. Joyce and I both are Vietnam veterans, obviously. We're a bit older. But there are a lot of young single mothers who have PTSD and things like that who need our support and our camaraderie. So we felt that we needed this chapter and it has proven to be true and we've become very successful. But one of the reasons that we wanted to do this event that we're doing on June 9th at Little Elm Park 
is so that we could let other veterans know about us that might need us, might need our camaraderie, our support, our resources, and things like that. So we'd like for you to help us get that information out to anybody that you know that might be a woman veteran to come out and join us on June 9th. It's all free at Little Elm Park. The formal program starts at 10 o'clock, and it'll be an all-day event with free picnic food and stuff to commemorate this day and the service of women. Thank you very much. And now do we have any amateur radio oper operators here to uh, be recognized? Come on forward. <clears throat> Whereas amateur radio operators are celebrating over a century of communicating over the airwaves, and continue to provide a bridge between peoples, societies, and countries by creating friendships and the sharing of ideas. And whereas the city of Louisville recognizes the members of the Louisville Amateur Radio Associ Association and the services they provide to emergency response organizations without, comp without compensation, and whereas these same individuals have further demonstrated their value in public assistance by providing free radio communications for local parades, concerts, and other entertainment events. And whereas the city of Louisville recognizes and appreciates the diligence of these hams who also serve as weather spotters in the Skywarn program of the National Weather Service, and whether, whereas the amateur radio field day exercise will take place on June 23rd, 24th, 2018, and is a 24-hour exercise and demonstration of radio amateurs' skills and readiness to provide self-supporting communications without further infrastructure. Now, therefore, Rudy Durham, mayor of the city of Louisville, along with the members of the city council, hereby officially recognize and designate June 18th through the 24th, 2018, as Amateur Radio Week in the city of Louisville, Texas. Previous was a hard act to follow, and uh, would like to iterate that the uh, public is invited to the June 23rd, 24th event. It'll be at the uh, main fire station if you want to come out and see what we do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next item is public hearings. Uh, City Secretary. Public hearing number one, continued public hearing. Consideration of an ordinance adding chapter 17.5 IH 35E corridor overlay district and amending several other chapters in the city code to support the, newly, the new overlay district. The IH 35E corridor overlay district is intended to implement the IH 35E corridor redevelopment plan adopted in November 2014 and includes building and envelope standards, architectural standards, landscape standards, street and streetscape standards, and screening standards. PNZ recommended approval by a vote of seven to zero. Several modifications to other chapters of the Louisville City Code are proposed to support the overlay district. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance <coughs> as set forth in the caption. Planning Director Richard Ludke is available to address any questions. Do we have anyone else to speak on this? Move to approve as presented. Oh, move to close the public hearing. I'm sorry, hearing. move to close the public hearing. My apologies. Yes. Second. The motion is second to close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Uh, we have a motion to approve. Move to approve as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. To the attorney. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the Louisville City Code to add a new chapter, Chapter 17.5 IH 35E Corridor Overlay District, which creates an overlay with the northern boundary consisting of North Garden Ridge Boulevard, the southern boundary consisting of the Southern City of Louisville Corporate Limit Line, the western boundary generally consisting of portions of McGee Lane, the KCS Railway, North Summit Avenue, Oakwood Lane, East Southwest Parkway, MacArthur Boulevard, SH 121, and Lake Vista Drive. And with the eastern boundary generally consisting of portions of SH 121, 
Lake Point Drive, Yates Street, Mackenzie Street, Harbor Drive, Lake Haven Drive, West Purnell Street, South Edna Avenue, West Main Street, Deegan Avenue, West College Street, Harn Drive, Millican Drive, the Casey S Railway, <coughs> Oak Ridge Boulevard, and the Dallas Area Rapid Transit Railway, and more specifically described in the attached Exhibit 1, amending Chapter 6 to update a cross-reference to the new overlay district chapter found in <coughs> Section 6-54, and to delete Section 6-77, properties impacted by the interstate I-35 widening. Amending Chapter 9.5, Sections 9.5-23 and 9.5-200, and Appendices 1 and B, and Chapter 11, Section 11-1, to revise the boundaries of the Old Town Design District. Amending Chapter 2, Section 2-201, to add fees for concept plans, requests for altern alternate alternative standards, and IH35E Corridor Overlay District Streetscape Improvement Fees in Lieu, providing for repealer severability penalty and an effective date and declaring an emergency. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Do you have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Oh, we did that already. Yeah. I had made that no, motion. Yeah. yeah that was Excuse me. Motion. Excuse me. Uh, we already had a motion. Yep. Thank you. Somebody wasn't paying attention, obviously. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. I, I want to thank the staff. Uh, for all the hard work on this and the public for all the uh, different hearings that were involved in getting this done. It is a major project coming up. Uh, I-35E is just now started being worked on, even though we're through with phase one, it's, it's nice and great right now. It's going to get more <coughs> congested, more problems with it, more uh, construction to be done over the next fill in the blank number of years and uh, we'll see how it works in the future. But this should be a good model for it. Thank you. Public hearing number two, consideration of an ordinance granting a special use permit for a gasoline service station on 0.765 acres located on the southwest corner of State Highway 121 Business and Bellard Boulevard with three associated variances. The SGP request is for a 7-Eleven gasoline service station. The three requested variances are A, to reduce the control of access of 150 feet along Bel, -El, Bel Air Boulevard, B, to reduce the control of access of 250 feet along State Highway 121 business, and C, to reduce the required driveway spacing of 230 feet along State Highway 121 business. This SUP and associated variances have been approved by the City Council on April 3rd, 2017, but they have expired. The applicant now seeks reapproval. PNZ recommended approval of the SUP by a vote of seven to zero. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance and requested variances set forth in the caption. We have both Planning Director Richard Lutke and John Featherstone from the Dimension Group available to address any questions. Okay. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Okay. Do we have a motion to close the public hearing? Move to close. Motion to close. Is there a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Hearing is closed. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Did you get that, the secretary? Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and second. Councilor? This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by granting a special use permit for a gasoline service station on approximately 0.765 acres, legally described as Lot 1R Block A Chevron Edition, located at 1301 South State Highway 121 Business and Zone General Business District, providing for repealer severability, penalty, and an effective date, and declaring an emergency. Okay. Is there any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Public hearing number three, consideration of Louisville Juvenile Curfew Ordinance. The recommendation is that the City Council conduct the public hearing as set forth in the caption. Mayor, I have no cards on this item. Okay. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Move to close the public hearing. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. The next stall on this one, didn't mm -hmm. Okay. The next item on the agenda is visitor citizen forum. At this time, any person with business before the council not scheduled on the agenda may speak to the council. No formal action can be taken on these items at this meeting. We have one speaker tonight, Al Luttrell. Mr. Luttrell, if you could please state your name and address for the record. Al Luttrell, 7th District. If you come forward, please. Al Luttrell, 767 North Valley Parkway. Okay. I'd like to just, uh, uh, just mention that with the Garden Ridge Trail, uh, hike and bike trail, project that's currently been underway for several, I guess, several years now, that uh, being one of the residents of some 24, 22, 24 residents that actually face this hike and bike trail that, that potential or perhaps maybe it could be diverted around our properties down to connect in with the Prairie Creek Trail that's already there. Uh, because all the rest of it is basically it's facing uh, barrier walls and that sort of thing all the way up through the rest of the project, uh, other than uh, some businesses between uh, Main Street and College Parkway. Okay, thank you. you I'm concerned about on? liability coming across our property with our mailboxes there and our and our cars and that sort of thing. You, you know, what happens if somebody runs off the trail or off the bike path okay. and hurts themselves? That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next item on the agenda is a consent agenda. All of the following items on the consent agenda are considered to be self-explanatory by the council and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so requests. For a citizen to request removal of an item, a speaker card must be filled out and submitted to the city secretary. Mayor, I've received no cards. Okay. We have a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Second. We have a second now. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is item five consideration of a variance to section 4-28 regarding a temporary sales and marketing trailer at 1424 Lake Falls Terrace. Beezer Homes is developing a residential project south of Windhaven Parkway, west of Josie Lane, and has requested a variance to place a temporary sales and marketing trailer on their site for pre-sales before the model home is completed. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the variance as set forth in the cap above caption not to exceed 12 months or until the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the model home, whichever occurs first. Director of, Director of Neighborhoods and Inspection Services, Wayne Snell, is available to address any questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve with conditions? Make a motion to approve with the conditions set forth. Okay. Is there second. a second? Yeah. Who was that from? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Item six. Consideration of an ordinance amending Chapter 4, Buildings and Building Regulations by repealing and replacing Article 7, Substandard Buildings in its entirety. At the May 21, 2018 City Council Workshop, staff briefed City Council on various code changes to the substandard structure regulations. The proposed ordinance reflects the direction given by City Council. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance as set forth in the caption. Any questions or comments? Do I have a motion to approve? Move to, Move to approve. approve. It's presented. We have a motion to approve and a second. Second. City Attorney. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending Chapter 4 Buildings and Building Regulations by repealing and replacing Article 7 substandard buildings in its entirety, providing for repealer severability and a penalty and an effective date and declaring an emergency. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Agenda item seven. Consideration of an ordinance amending section 7-246 temporary food establishment events. 
The proposed revisions, which apply only to TABC permitted licensed wineries, breweries, and distilleries located in the Old Town Design District, expand the number of allowable temporary food establishment events, eliminate the elapsed time requirements between such events, and specifies a two-day duration for each permit. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance as set forth in the caption above. We have Assistant City Manager Claire Swan and Manager of Health and Animal Services Chris McGinnon available for questions. We also have the following individuals who have submitted cards in support. William Shaw, Natasha um, Detart, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, and, the, and um, Amanda Ferguson with Maine and Mill. We also have Ray Hernandez who would like to speak before the City Council. Okay, Mr. Hernandez. You can give us your name and address for the record, Ray. Ray Hernandez, I reside at 2365 Bar Hill uh, Boulevard in Highland Village, Texas. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Prohibition Chicken. The restaurant's just right across the parking lot over to my left. Uh, I just wanted to come today and, and in support of, of, of this uh, action and, and thank the mayor, city manager, city council and staff for um, looking for uh, innovative ways that we can drive more uh, traffic down to the Old Town District. It is important to the business community. Some might have some pause of why a restaurant would uh, support food establishments at uh, the winery, the distillery, and the, uh, and the brewery, but we feel that the more traffic we get down here, it benefits all of us. And so we appreciate uh, the steps you are taking today, and, and we stand here in support. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments at this time? I just want to uh, thank the staff because I know they, they turned this around pretty quickly and they worked with uh, the Maine and Mill Association. So just a good job. Okay. Thank you. Ditto. Okay. I, I'd like to make a request that um, we come back and look at this um, for possible extension in like the September time frame of this year. It gets us through the summer, lets us see what the busy season looks like. Um, and then we can discuss whether it makes sense to extend that maybe to the 12 or, or leave it at 8. Um, uh, Mr. Hernandez makes a great point. Um, we we want to be able to get foot traffic down here by the same token. I also want to respect um, the massive investment that our brick and mortars do make. Um, and I don't want to undercut that. So I want to make sure that we're balancing that well um, and supporting all the businesses down here. So there's, uh, there, there's, I think, opportunity to have a little bit more discussion okay. in September. Good. Thanks for those comments. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion? City Attorney? This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending Chapter 7, Article 7, Division 4, Section 7-246, Temporary Food Establishment Events of the Louisville City Code by adding a subsection setting forth requirements for temporary food establishment event permits for a TABC permitted licensed distillery brewery or winery in the Old Town Design District, providing a repealer severability penalty and an effective date and declaring an emergency. Okay, thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thanks everybody for being here on that one. Adam eight. Discussion and consideration of appointments to various city boards, commissions, committees. City Council will need to identify interview teams, interview dates, and determine which team will interview which board, commission, or committee. The recommendation is that the City Council proceed with the appointment process. Do you have that list? I'll that read we the talked list. about earlier? Yes. Okay. So interview teams would be Mayor Pro Tem Daniels and Councilman Ferguson. Their um, boards and committees would be Animal Services Advisory Committee, Arts Advisory Board, Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, Louisville Housing Finance Corporation, and the Oil and Gas Advisory Board. The next team would be Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Jones and Councilman Gilmore. They would have Library Board, Old Town Design Review Committee, and the Planning, Planning and Zoning, and the Louisville 2025 Advisory Board. The next team would be Mayor Durham and Councilman Troyer. They would have Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone Number 1 Board of Directors, Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone Number 2 Board of Directors, Zoning Board of Adjustment, and Park Board. Do you have a motion to approve that? So moved. Second. A motion to second. Is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, okay. We'll
We'll start with the reports. I'd like to thank the mayor and the council for your support over these past few years for the I-35 overlay ordinance. I think we've uh, reached a major milestone tonight in passing that ordinance. Uh, I do want to mention and thank all of my fellow staff members from various departments who helped make this uh, ordinance a reality, particularly our city attorney and assistant city attorney for their countless hours of guidance and review on the ordinance, and then participation from uh, all of the other departments, um, from planning, economic development, engineering, parks and recreation, public services, um, inspections, permitting, and neighborhood services, and, and last but not least, the city manager's office. It really was a team effort and an amazing effort. Uh, very, very impressed, very, very proud. Uh, couldn't work with a better team. Uh, and staff does look forward to implementing uh, this ordinance and working with uh, landowners in the development community, and m more particularly, the gradual transformation of the I-35 corridor through Louisville. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was gonna also uh, thank AGL contractors, which I don't see any sign of them right now, but I know they're still around. Uh, but their uh, equipment's been moved out. And uh, I wanna thank them for the work they did. And TxDOT. Uh, it, it was not painless, but it did work, and it was almost seamless on the transition of it. Thank you. Stacy, Chief? Okay, Lake. Mayor, we're approaching uh, one foot below the, the conservation pool level. Okay, good. Gina? Brenda? ACM? ACM? No? Okay. Brent? Nothing, Mayor. Brenda? Uh, yeah, I just want to remind everybody that next week school is ending, and although we'll be happy not to see the school zones, let's remember to slow down uh, because the kiddos will be out in the streets, and let's be more careful. Also, to remind our citizens, our runoff elections are going right now through Saturday, and there'll be the early voting will be on Monday, June 11th, and June 12th, and with the final runoff on June 16th. So go out there and vote. Okay, TJ. Mayor, I want to apologize to anyone who's viewing this on tape delay. So this is only for the folks here in the room. Um, June 5th, tomorrow, is a Pass on Plastic Day. So I would encourage everybody who's here um, to avoid plastic packaged food and drink products for the next 24 hours. How crazy is it that we have oranges packaged in shrink wrap? Food packaged in something that will live millions of times longer than the food we eat. So if you all, as you're out and about, if you have uh, some sort of food product that you can pass on, please take a, take a selfie, take a snapshot, use the hashtag pass on plastic. And you know, maybe just for one day, we can lower our need for this plastic stuff. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. City Manager? Yes, sir. Okay. Councilor Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> you got several things going on at the MCL Grand. Uh, coming up. Um, first one I want to mention is the Quaby Sisters will be performing June 16th uh, in the final Texas Tune Show. They're a world famous act, uh, actually originally out of North Texas, um, but they've toured all over the world. Uh, how many know they performed with Warren Buffett on ukulele? Um, that's an interesting story. Uh, they've uh, performed with uh, symphony orchestras. They performed with the Dallas Symphony before. They've been at Clyde Warren Park. Uh, but they've been on many, many TV and radio shows and have lots of recordings and uh, notoriety, and, and they're a fantastic show. So if you don't have tickets, I would get them quickly because that show will most likely sell out. Uh, Diversity Dance Recital is being held on June 8th, and that's presented by the Diversity Dance Studio. Uh, there's a stage play, Mommy, I Forgive You, on June 9th, and another stage play, What Lies Beneath, on June 10th, and those are presented by Writings on a Page. Uh, Garden Secrets class is doing butterfly gardening on June 14th, and that's presented by Keep Louisville Beautiful. And then uh, public events, uh, Fest a Theater, June 23rd by DFW Play. Sounds of Louisville begins tomorrow night uh, and will continue on Tuesdays through June and July. Uh, art pop-ups continue in the plaza on Saturdays, Pilates in the plaza on Thursdays and Saturdays, yoga in the plaza on Wednesdays, and acoustic jam always every Friday night presented by the Visual Arts League. And in the art galleries, we have Texas Bigger and Bolder <coughs> through June 16th. And in the North uh, Quarter Gallery, we or North Quarter Hallway, we have uh, Visual Arts League cell phone shots. 
and that continues through June 9th, and that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bob? Nothing, Mayor. Okay, Councilor? Just, just want to, I do. I just want to emphasize early voting is going on. It started today. It's Monday through Saturday this week from 8 to 5. Next Monday and Tuesday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Election day, June 16th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And just a reminder that all Louisville residents, regardless of which county they live in, will be voting at the Louisville Municipal Annex on Election Day. And they can also vote there um, during early voting. Now, early voting, does that count the county spots that have open? This is only for city, for it's city runoffs, city yeah, no, no counties. Okay, thank you. Officer, thanks for your uh, work in the community. Thank you. What do you say? Next item on our agenda is closed session in accordance with Texas Government Code Subchapter D, number one, section 551.072, real estate, property acquisition, number two, section 551.087, economic development, deliberation regarding economic development negotiations. Okay. We'll now go into closed session. We'll call the meeting back to order. Is Move. there any action to be taken? Move to adjourn. Second. We have a motion to second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Probably from the building. Thank you all.